Today, I am going to chat about the scientific inquiry process. How do we go about deciding if something is true or not? How do we, how do we go about, how do we do science? So this kind of came about because I've, I've been frustrated over the years. Many of my friends, some of them with very high IQs and, and good hearted folks just love what they call conspiracy theories. And I actually am going to argue and say that they are not conspiracy theorists. They are conspiracy conjecturists. And I started using that term recently because I, I discovered what the difference is. And I thought I would share with you what my study uh, has taught me. So I, I got these nine points uh, and AI did help me. Yes, indeed. And uh, I'm going to go through each of those and chat about them, uh, about how to go about figuring stuff out. Here's the, here's the scientific process. So the first thing that something starts with is conjecture. And that's described as an initial idea or guess, often based on limited information or observation. So that's, yeah, we just go out, we see something, and we're like, huh, that's, I wonder what, huh, that's weird. I wonder what the, yeah, yeah oh, I don't know. That's, huh. That's all, uh, that's all conjecture is. And then maybe we, we have this idea of, you know, maybe the reason that happened is, uh, you know, I dropped this apple, I let go of it, and it went straight down to the ground. Maybe it's because there's a big, strong fan up above that's pushing it downward. And that's conjecture. And there, there's limited information on this. So this is just the bare foundational thing. This is what I observe most conspiracies are. Uh, the things that I hear about, the, the, the one that a friend sent me of the guy who had a flat map and was saying, here is the route between Japan and Los Angeles, and there was had to be an emergency landing, and why did the plane go to Alaska? Uh, because that's way out of the, the direct route, therefore the earth is flat. Um, that's conjecture. That's not even a conspiracy theory. Giving that harebrained thing that took you know, 30 seconds to debunk, um, giving that any credence whatsoever, uh, calling it a theory, no, that's conjecture. The next step is hypothesis formation. And so here, a more structured, testable prediction or explanation is developed. So here, I, I might say for the, for the idea of something falling out of my hand and, and hitting the ground, the apple, I might say, um, okay, I think it's a fan up above. And so I am going to predict that if I do it 100 times, it's going to do it every single time, and it's never going to go a different direction, which tells me the fan is directly overhead. And so then I would move on to the third step, which is experimentation and data collection. And this phase involves gathering empirical evidence to test the hypothesis. So hypothesis is there's a fan pushing straight down or blowing air straight down. That's why the apple that I let go of my hand, that's the reason it goes straight down. So what kind of a test would I do? Well, I guess I could start out by doing a uh, uh, blocking above my hand. So if this is where I'm gonna let the apple go, I could put something up here to block the uh, air from the fan. And if I do that and the, the fan, uh, and, that, and, and therefore the apple doesn't fall, Oh, that's one more step toward, you know, maybe that is a fan up there. So I conduct this test. I put the piece of uh, plywood up above to make sure it blocks all of the wind from this fan that I think exists, this invisible fan. And I let go of the apple and I do it a hundred times and it keeps hitting the ground every single time. Well, at this point, I'm doing step number four, which is analysis. I'm analyzing the data that I've collected. The data is every single time I let go of the apple, it hit the ground with the area blocked that the fan would be coming from. So that's kind of, that's that. We know that that's probably not a fan blowing straight down. So now that I've conducted this, this research and I have analyzed it, I have concluded, okay, I don't think that's why the apple is falling. Now, maybe I'm still curious about why the apple is falling, but I have pretty conclusively proven that that's not why. Now, there's a step we'll get to later, peer review, that I, I put out there and I say, hey, this is what I did, and the apple kept falling, so I don't think it's air being blown straight down uh, from a fan. 
Now, somebody could say, hey, using plywood isn't a good way of doing this because the air can go around it in a jet stream effect, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then maybe they would use a different kind of material and maybe they would put edges on it and they would try that and publish the results. Um, but I learned from my thing, okay, that's not it. So now maybe my second uh, hypothesis is, okay, I think it is the... Uh, there's a vacuum kind of thing down below that is sucking things straight down. And it's it's coming from the ground. The ground is porous and it's sucking stuff straight down. Well, then maybe I would put that piece of plywood on the ground and drop the apple a hundred times, see if it still goes straight down with the wind blocked. So that could be another experimentation data collection process. Okay, so now we've gone through those, we've analyzed it, and it refuted the hypothesis. So we figured out that that's not what it is. So we cannot go on at this point to the next thing, which is theory development. We, we can't call it a, a fan above conspiracy theory. It's not a theory. It is a failed hypothesis. It, we, have, we have refuted the hypothesis that it's a fan blowing straight down. So there's no way we could even say, I have a hypothesis that blah, blah, blah. No, because I, I destroyed that hypothesis. And I definitely can't say I have a theory that there's a fan blowing down. No, it didn't even get to the theory point. So I could simply say, I don't like the evidence that I received. I still think it's a fan blowing down. And me saying that, me thinking that would be conjecture. And that is all that it is and that ain't much that is the very bottom basic useless that's where all ideas start but that's the very bottom so that is not gonna prove something to me don't send me an email uh with a, a link to a video about somebody conjecturing that there's a conspiracy of blah 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 no okay so now we're on this step number five now we're getting to the theory theory development a theory is formed when a hypothesis is consistently supported by a large body of evidence. It's a comprehensive explanation of some aspect of the natural world. So this is kind of a big, like there's a, there are a lot of standards to, to, to being a theory. Like it's got to meet a lot of tests before we can call a thing a theory. And one person having the idea or a few people just repeating the idea that they heard from the original person, that a theory does not make. We're nowhere close. That's not what it is. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that again. A theory is formed when a hypothesis is consistently supported by a large body of evidence. It's a compre comprehensive explanation of some aspect of the natural world. So this takes a lot. It takes a lot to have a theory. There's a lot of groundwork that has to be laid and a theory is a solid big deal. Okay, so what comes next? Next, number six is further testing and refine refinement. Theories are not static. They are continuously tested and refined with new data and insights. So this is, if we're looking at anything, we think that Bill Gates wants to kill everybody in the world. So when the Covidians attacked, he decided to put out a, a, a thing, a juice that would kill everybody. That's the, that's the conspiracy conjecture that we're hearing. Um, we, we're not even going to, well, I, 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 I am even hesitating to use that example because that would not have even passed up to hypothesis. And if it was a hypothesis, it wouldn't have passed up to theory. So, don't come to me with that kind of silliness. I, I just uh, don't do it. So let's say that we we did decide the, the best thing we can get, all the science we're getting, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a big but at the end of this video. All the scientific information that we're getting is that it was uh, the this virus started because of bats or something, and they were being served along with... Uh, tofu skunks or whatever and because the animals were mixed that created this new new virus so that's one conjecture there's another conjecture that uh there was a, a lab that let uh, a virus leak so basically the lab its job is hey 
if, if something really, really nasty ever hits the world, we're going to wish we had looked into this beforehand and we're going to wish what's the worst possible combination, putting stuff together, what could happen? Let's build this horrible, horrible virus that could happen and then let's test how to protect the world from it. Let's see if we can come up with solutions before something like that ever happens, which is kind of smart. Now, I don't know if you want to develop these things, but it, it's a good way of thinking of saying, hey, here are the possible things that could go wrong. Um, what are our solutions going to be? That's just basic. Like, every business person should be doing that, um, just coming up with contingency plans. So that was one theory is that there was a lab that was doing that and then it leaked it. And so if any of those things kind of come to the top, and a lot of the scientists are agreeing with this, and they're saying, yeah, we think this is what it is. Still, this further testing and refinement is needed. Um, so at no point is the theory completely done. We're still looking into it and saying, oh, was it really a lab leak? Or if the, the big news was that it was a, a bat fever, was it really bat fever? Could it have been something else? Could it have been a, a fan pushing down from below or sucking from the bottom or a lab leak or whatever? Look at all these things and, and see how they are. See, see if they, they hold water. Um, so that's the further testing and refinement. And then the, the step number seven, debate and peer review. At this point, everybody who has an opinion about it, everybody who thinks they have a, a, a theory, first they do their conjecture, they go through this whole step-by-step -step process, and then if it makes it all the way to the theory, it, they put these theories out and all the scientists in the world, everybody can look at these theories and look at them and go, oh, you know, I don't think the testing was done correctly. And they can, they write a, a something, a peer review, they, 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 in the peer review process, they write this thing saying your testing was lousy. This is why that this part of the testing didn't uh, it shouldn't hold any water because your testing was wrong or your sample group was too big or too small or they'll just try to poke holes in it. And so it's out there for the world to do this and everybody's trying to poke holes into it. And then maybe there's a whole another uh, that we go back to that last step, that uh, further testing and refinement. We go back to that step again, and we we hone in more and more. And then eventually, when there's no more argument, when everybody is saying, hey, any more ideas why this isn't a good idea? We, we don't care if it's a good idea or not. We want truth. We want, that's all we want is truth. So does anybody have better information that can help us get to the true truth? And when there's nothing else coming up, nothing has made it through all of those steps to get up to this point, then everybody's looking around and going, yeah, you know, I guess we kind of have to agree. That looks like that's where we are on this thing. It looks like it's blah, blah, blah. And maybe it's a very complex thing. Maybe it's something that not everybody can understand. Like I couldn't give you a good definition uh, scientifically worthy uh, definition of gravity, like well, the apple is falling because of gravity. I don't know. I don't know enough about, I guess that would be physics. I just don't know enough. So, so I couldn't give a good educated explanation for it or for about a billion other things in the world. Um, I just have to say, oh, you know what it looks like for many, many years, people have used chinking on log cabin uh construction to keep air and critters and such from getting between the logs uh, okay i guess chinking is something that does that it's a good thing that works for that purpose and i go along with it until i hear something better so you don't have to understand everything completely um but it but this whole scientific process is out there for anybody who wants to challenge it may do so and again i've got a big butt at the end of this Okay, so that's when a consensus forms. And even my woke friend, except they know a bunch, that's what I, how I describe chat GPT, uh, they describe consensus as, over time, a consensus may form if a theory withstands extensive testing and scrutiny. However, consensus is not absolute. It's based on the current best understanding. There is never a point that anything, no matter how sure we think something is, hopefully there's some somebody out there thinking, huh, but I wonder if gravity really is why the, the apple is falling. And hopefully they're looking into it. And hopefully they're going through this whole step to work their way up and get to the theory part and then get up to the peer review part and go, go through the whole process. 
Okay, so we, we just finished the consensus part. Then the last, number nine, is ongoing inquiry. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. Science is dynamic, ChatGPT says. New evidence can challenge and shift established theories. So you get new evidence for something, great. We'll look at it and we'll change it. And the good scientists aren't like emotionally tied to things. Like even somebody who really, really, really strongly believes that gravity exists or that germs exist or that viruses exist or whatever. A person who really strongly believes that because it's what everybody's always believed for a long, long time, uh, they should be kind of curious and excited. If somebody pops up and says, no, gravity doesn't exist. It's blah, blah, blah. Cool. I want to hear about this. Now, if it's, if it's too quackballish, if it's just nuts, then it's not going to get beyond that conjecture stage um, b- because that, that person probably isn't going to get up to the level of hypothesis formation or experimentation and data collection. Uh, they're not going to get up to that. It'll, it'll never make it up. And that's one of the shortcomings uh, of the scientific method, scientific methodology, is that it's not completely pure. The path isn't as good. Now, what I just described is how a system should work. Nothing wrong with what I've described. However, now we're going to take that system and we're going to drop it into the real world. And this is the part I was mentioning. This is the big but. If you drop this scientific method into any civilization, any society, it is going to be affected by the biases of that civilization. And so here's just an example. If now, 2023, uh, I think everyone, just about 99.9% of the people in the world who are aware of such a thing, believe that the Holocaust happened, Hitler was a bad guy, and Hitler had a lot of things that he, he might have been right about and wrong about, whatever. But overall, he did some really nasty stuff. He killed a lot of gypsies and homosexuals and, and people with uh, mental retardation and, and Jews and all kinds of people. He killed a lot of people, and, and that was very bad of him, and, and that's awful. And I think we all agree that that is what happened. And this is a this is a point of history which is different than a natural occurrence in the world but this analogy holds i believe fairly well if i wanted to do a study if i was a scientist and in this case it would be a social scientist or a historian or something like that if i said hey world i am a professor of history uh, and i have this hypothesis that I've really contemplated. I have this hypothesis that Hitler really didn't kill any Jews and he was a good guy. And it was the Roth, not the Rothschilds, the, uh, yeah. House of Rothschild. Yeah. The, the Rothschilds conspired to make Hitler look bad. And I don't think that any Jews were killed during what people call the Holocaust. And I would like money to conduct more research on this. I'd like to spend a year doing it. So I'd like 300 grand for me and my team to to do the research on this. Do you think anybody is going to fund this quack concept? Probably not. Nobody is going to fund this research. However, if I go to the uh, Jews for the preservation of firearms ownership or some other important big Jewish organization. And I say, Hey, I want to do this historical inquiry into some of the reasoning behind why Hitler killed so many Jews so that we can prevent this happening to Jews in the future. Okay. I'd probably get my 300 grand for that. And the reason I use that extreme example is because this kind of thing also happens uh, on other topics. So if I take something that isn't popular, like let's say that I say, I don't think that humans have caused uh, horrible climate change that's going to kill us all within the next hundreds of years. I think climate's always going up and down and changing and humans didn't have all that much of an impact on it. And if so, it's not a big deal, whatever. That's what I think, and I want to do a study about that. 
nobody would fund me for that study. Now, if on the other hand, I went in and I said, hey, I think that climate change is a real deal and I want to do a study. By the time I get the first three letters of study out, they're going to interrupt me and throw money at me. The UN will, the World Economic Forum, the, the, all the governments of developed countries, they will all throw money at me for this research to better build up the case that there is climate change and it is man-caused, human-caused. So that's going to skew things. That is really going to skew things. And then you get a, a real scientist. You get somebody who actually knows something about a, a topic, studies it, uh, which I wouldn't say that I'm an expert on climate change. Like I don't even, I don't really understand things. I just, I hear things like, oh, that's interesting. That makes sense. But I'm not an expert. Uh, recently, you might have seen the interview I did with uh, Paul Burgess over on Disenthrall. Uh, go to the Disenthrall channel and look at their, uh, their, their YouTube and uh, channel and you'll find that video there. And Paul Burgess is a scientist. He's the real deal guy. Like he has a, a degree in engineering, uh, in climate related engineering, like water resources. And, and he studied rain and, and how it, how it comes, how weather patterns happen. Like he studied this stuff. That's what he went to college for four years of study on that. And then he went out and worked, worked in that business. Um, and, he spent a lot of time and effort learning about this stuff. And regardless of his, what the parchment paper says, he studied it and then he went out and actually did it as a job. He's an expert in this. And so when he has a, an idea and he brings it to the scientific community, what ought to happen is, hey man, that sounds weird because everybody else is saying something different, but we want to listen to you. Oh my gosh, if we're wrong, that would be awesome. Um, how exciting would that be? We want the truth. What do you have for us? And then they would listen with an open mind. And if the evidence he provided was bad, if he didn't pass those tests, well, then they go, you know what? That, that's, that's didn't make it. Didn't even make it up to theory or didn't make it up to, uh, obviously not the new consensus at, at that point. But Paul Burgess would not even be listened to. He, he isn't listened to. He is mocked. He's ridiculed. Uh, institutions of higher learning are not interested in talking to him or seeing what he has to say. Well, hey, well, you know, let's do a little study here and see if there's anything to this. Zero interest. The same would be true of anything that is not politically correct or is not in line with the attitude of the world, of the, of the mob at the time. And so think about all the study that is not being done by serious scientific minds because it's not getting funded. Or if somebody is willing to do it for free, then it's not being looked at. It's just being ignored. The, the person writes their report on it and they say, yeah, I've gotten to the theory level. Here's this paper on what I think's going on and what I've tested. Here's the paper, please peer review it. And nobody will even look at it. So the scientific method does not always work because humans mess it up. I believe in scientific methodology. So the method is good, but people can mess it up and do mess it up. So that's my big but. Now here is my challenge that I don't have an answer for. I don't know how to tell if something is true or not. And there are a lot of people who have wrestled with this for thousands of years. And I, so I'm probably not gonna come up with a big answer. I think it comes down to each of us as an individual. Uh, we have to make our minds up for ourselves. And some of us are going to have very sloppy systems of thinking. And we're just going to hear anything and go, oh, well, okay. Oh, yeah, that does matter. Okay, the earth is flat. And then you hear something else. And, oh, it's actually concave. And, and you're going to hear all this stuff. And you're going to go for everything. That's somebody who's not good at thinking will do that. Somebody who's not a critical thinker. A person who is a critical thinker is going to be able to look at things, at least on a, a layperson level, and do a little bit of testing. I, I don't know about mechanicking, but if somebody says an F-250 diesel six liter truck is more powerful, uh, the diesel is more powerful than the gas six liter, I don't even know if they both go by liters or not, but okay, I can test that. I can check speed. I can check pulling power. I can, uh, I, there are ways that I can test that without knowing that much about internal combustion engines, 
or uh, gasoline engines, diesel engines, I, I don't know. Uh, but I can still do some cursory testing or if somebody explains the results, okay, I can, I can form an opinion about that. There are some things that I am questioning. I don't question whether or not the world is flat or round. I am pretty sure it's spherical. Uh, and I, that's just, I can't back that up. Um, I'm just, I'm trusting what the scientific method has done. Um, and then I'm looking at what are some other things? Oh, the, the, the big virus, the, the recent virus. I think there was a virus. I think viruses exist. I think germs exist. Um, I don't know. I am, I'm not a medical person. I can't prove it. Um, I also can't prove that a, a million other things having to do with medicine and mechanics and photosynthesis and leather work and driving a backo. I, I don't know. I, I, I have to go at some point and say, okay, looks like everybody turns the, the steering wheel counterclockwise and that makes you go left. Okay. I'm going to give that a try, even though I've never driven a, a backo before. I think that's what I'll do. And I bet it'll go left because that's kind of how these things work. You make your best guess, you go along. Now, if somebody comes up with some good evidence otherwise, then you look at it. Uh, but if they don't, I don't think it's worth spending our time and our energy when we could be doing productive things, um, thinking, oh, maybe that's true. I'm going to follow this rabbit hole. If you're going to do that, don't, I mean, you're welcome to do it for entertainment, obviously. And I think that's what most conspiracy conjecturists do. They just do it for entertainment. I wish that somebody who heard some whack ball crazy idea said, huh, I'm going to look into this. I actually know something about this area, this field of thought, or I'm going to study, I'm going to take a year and I'm going to dedicate 10 hours a week to learning more about engines, internal combustion engines, diesel, gasoline. I'm, I'm going to learn more about mechanicing and engines. And I'm maybe just watching a ton of videos and I'm going to watch thousands of hours of videos. And then I will have enough expertise that I can better decide if a diesel or a gasoline powered vehicle is more powerful. Um, that's what I wish people would do is take it seriously and not just do it for entertainment. Somebody puts out the wacko idea. Oh yeah, hey, let's go for this one. Let's be excited about this and angry. Oh, Acapulco, the big uh, hurricane there. It hit Max Egan's house. Like it aimed right for him. And it was obviously the government created this hurricane and sent it right to his house. Um, Let's talk about conjecture. Have we talked about that yet? Oh, yeah, we did. That's what that is. It's nothing more. It's nothing more. Um, so I'm just encouraging some some sober, real quality, critical thinking. Uh, I, I think it could be good for all of us. And one final thing that I will add is that there are some some reasons for suspicion. There are some reasons to to get going on the conjecture stage of the, the scientific method, the scientific inquiry process. There are some reasons. If you know a lot about a particular something, let's say a particular way of selling something, you're a salesman, you've done lots of study in this field, and you know that this particular method is to ask the person about their home life and about their work. And then once you find out what their home like, home life is work, what their home life is like and what their work life is like, then you will be able to, let's say you're selling them a vehicle. You'll be able to hone in and say the next step after knowing that now I'm going to hone my sales spiel for their work needs or for their home needs. And this is just a, a, a example. I don't know much about if that salesperson then, 20 years later goes to an auto dealership and the friendly salesman says, Hey, how are you doing? Great. Oh, great. So what kind of work do you do? And, uh, Oh, cool. Are you buried? Do you have kids? Well, oh, okay. And this person is going to know this isn't friendly, accidental, lighthearted chit chat. This person is using the method of learning about, let's see if I can say it correctly this time, learning about home life and work life and the needs for both. And that is the process. This person now, anytime they hear a salesman say that, they know where the salesman is going. And so if a person is a 
a person who has studied history from an anarcho-capitalist perspective, from a voluntarist perspective, uh, from a, a contrarian, from a, a critical perspective, it's likely that you might have formed the opinion that governments like to have emergencies. They like to create them or exaggerate them so that they can then swoop in and say that they're going to solve this emergency, get all the people to be willing to let them steal the taxes from them, send their kids off to fight this horrible, scary new thing. Like if you know the system of why governments have wars, why they make wars happen, why governments and another entity make those things happen. If you know that system and then you see two countries getting ready to fight, the, the rulers of each country are getting ready to send their subjects to fight each other. When you see this, you know, oh, yeah, this is that system. And you have then, then you have the right to be suspicious. Now you can start with conjecture and say, I think that maybe the good people of this country and the good people of that country who are just going about their daily lives as doctors and mechanics and just living lives, I don't think they have a problem with the people on the other side of that imaginary line. They, they don't have a problem with them. It's the ruling class. And do the ruling class even have that big of a problem with each other? Probably not. Once you know the system, then you know why there are conflicts like that. And so I give some grace to conspiracy conjecturists. Uh, if you know how the big pharma works, if you, if you know how the medical cartel in the United States works, if you know some of these things, uh, then yeah, you're going to be more suspicious. But just because I agree that you have the right to be suspicious, you still need to have good, solid evidence. You still need to follow this nine-step process. You need to take it seriously, and, and you need to quit embarrassing me by saying that you are a, a freedom-minded person, and then you go off and you're a conspiracy conjecturous whack ball. Those are two completely different things. Um, you, you can be both the Venn diagram. You can be a wacko bananas conspiracy conjecturous and also think that everything ought to be voluntary. That's okay. But if you're going to be spouting your nuts, so bananas stuff, please don't introduce yourself as that one circle of the Venn diagram that has nothing to do with it, what you're getting ready to say. Does that, does that make sense? Would you do that for me, please?